Welcome, welcome everyone. We are thrilled to have you here with us and so honored to be able to host this very important exhibit about the White Rose. Um, we feel so, so honored that the consulate reached out to us and made this possible. And um, we hope that you will join us today and share with us the uh, remarkable story of these young people. An exhibit like this doesn't happen by itself, and I have many people to thank. Um, but in particular, I want to offer special thanks to Consul General Ralph Holleman and Cultural and Press Affairs Liaison Liz von Wagner of the Consulate General of the Federal Republic of Germany for partnering with us to bring the White Rose exhibit to Boston College. Dr. Tom Wall, Boston College University Librarian, and Dr. Charles Gallagher, SJ, Boston College Associate Professor of History and Chair of the Catholic Studies Department, for generously co-sponsoring the exhibit. And the members of our panel, who will be introduced to you shortly. And finally, Kevin Tringali, Boston College Library's Exhibit Specialist and Senior Library Assistant, for helping to set up and promote the exhibit and for taking photographs of the event today. It's now my pleasure <coughs> to introduce Consul General Ralf Horlemann, who will offer opening remarks. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Esther, for uh, introducing us. Um, thank you very much also to the, the Dean of the School, uh, Tom Stegmann, who is here today. We are very, very grateful that um, Boston College offered to host uh, the exhibition on the White Rose. It is um, the fifth venue uh, of this exhibition in the New England States uh, since we brought it here. Uh, at the end of last year. And um, just to give you the background why this exhibition came here, um, it came during a journey I organized for 12 Boston rabbis last year to Germany, to Berlin and Munich. And um, while we were in Munich, we had a brief stopover at my alma mater, my university, the Ludwig Maximilians Universität and uh, the Institute for Political Science at the university is named after the siblings Scholl, Geschwister Scholl Institute. So um, I um, showed to the rabbis um, uh, the venue at the Ludwig Maximilians Universität and uh, they had this um, uh, part of this, this exhibition there and um, they were so impressed by by this student resistance movement that I decided I have to bring this here. So um, we've had a, a number of exhibitions uh, on the White Rose here, and now we are very glad that it is here at Boston College with maybe a new angle, um, which uh, we can uh, look at the White Rose movement and also to the resistance to the Nazi regime um, in general. Um, there was, of course, when, when we showed the exhibition at other places, and I discussed, for example, with students from Boston Latin School, uh, that was very interesting because they were more or less unaware that there was any resistance in Germany against Hitler. And of course, there, was not, there were not many resistance movements, and the White Rose was very small. It was a handful of students very young people, and Professor Huber. Um, but otherwise, there were some smaller resistance movements coming from um, um, the socialist and communist movement, from the trade unions, and some also from within the church, the Protestant and the Catholic uh, church, for example. And um, although it is true that um, about 130,000 Germans died at the hand of the Nazis because of their resistance. 
and hundreds of thousands were imprisoned or sent to, 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 to camps. Um, and about a million were interrogated by the Gestapo. Yet there was still the, the impression that there was not a, um, a strong and widespread um, resistance to the Nazis, which I think is true. On the other hand, the uh, students of the White Rose movement showed that although resistance was almost impossible, it was still important for them and I think for a many thousand people who have read their pamphlets, it was still important to make clear why they had to stand up for their conscience and why they, had, they felt they have to do something and they died for it, everyone in the White Rose Movement. So today's angle um, in the panel discussion uh, should uh, focus a little bit uh, about uh, what kind of resistance was there in Germany and what role did the church play and what role does and did religion play in this uh, resistance. And this is why I'm very grateful that we have this panel here today discussing it. I'm uh, really thrilled to see so many of you out here uh, on an afternoon shortly before the big snowstorm <laughs> will hit all of us. <laughs> so um, I uh, thank you very much for coming. I thank Boston College for hosting us. And uh, I'm looking forward to a very interesting discussion. And I hope you can all uh, not only enjoy, which is a, a problematic word maybe for such an exhibition, but profit from looking at the exhibition, which is a very simple one. It's not a high-tech, sophisticated exhibition, but I think it has a very simple and yet strong message. And this, I think, makes it worthwhile looking at it. So thank you very much again for joining us here this afternoon. And um, uh, join me in welcoming our panel here. Thank you very much. I'm now pleased to introduce the moderator of our panel today, Dr. Nicole Eaton, who is an assistant professor in the history department here at Boston College. Her fields of interest include modern European social and cultural history, German and East Central European history, and the Second World War and the Eastern Front. Her teaching interests include courses on Soviet history and the Russian Empire, the Second World War, and European history of cities and everyday life. She's currently working on a book on the extended German-Soviet encounter in Königsberg, Kaliningrad during the 1940s, the only place ruled by both Nazi Germany and Stalin's Soviet Russia as their own patrimony. So now, Nicole Eaton. Hello, everyone. I'm very uh, fortunate to be able to take part in a very small way. And I have to say that most of the substantive comments will come from our panelists here. But I will perform this very important formal function and ask a few questions after our panelists have spoken. Um, we have here from um, your left to right, uh, Dr. John Michalczyk, um, who is a uh, professor here of fine arts and the director of the university's film studies program. Uh, he's a filmmaker whose documentaries have focused on issues of social justice, and he often uses the examination of painful human experiences to shed light on our humanity. And his documentaries explore issues of discrimination, of hatred, of war, and peace. And he's published on the subject of the White Rose in the form of an edited volume, Confront Resistance in Nazi Germany. And he's worked with a White Rose survivor uh, both here at BC and um, at the University of Munich in uh, Germany. Uh, next, we'll have um, um, Father um, Bernard Knorn, SJ, uh, Dr. Knorn, who is a Jesuit priest from Germany and a research scholar in theology and is currently with us here in the School of Theology and Ministry as an international fellow. 
Uh, before that, he studied at uh, the University of Munich. I can see a theme here. Everyone here has been at the Geschwister Scholl Institute. Um, <laughs> I, I've given a talk there, <laughs> so that makes me too. Um, in Mainz, as well as in Rome, and has written his uh, doctoral thesis on uh, theology and reconciliation, which was published in 2016. His uh, research interests are on the Christian motivations of resistance against the Nazi regime and on the efforts of churches for reconciliation after the war. Uh, next, we have uh, Rabbi Sara Pasha Orlo, who is a conservative rabbi, uh, a certified chaplain, and the director of the spiritual care uh, at Hebrew Senior Life. Uh, she founded and leads the, uh, this uh, Hebrew Senior Life Chaplaincy Institute and is the great granddaughter of uh, General Kurt von Hammerstein, who attempted to arrest Hitler at the Polish, th uh, Polish front, and um, her uncles were part of the 1944 coup attempt against Hitler. Uh, uh, She's been a partner with the Action Reconciliation Service for Jewish uh, for Peace for the past decade uh, and brings a young German volunteer each year to work with Jewish elders and survivors at the HSL. And she's the co-author of Deathbed Wisdom of the Hasidic Masters, in addition to numerous articles and chapters in Spiritual Manifestos, Visions for Renewed Re Religious Life in America and flourishing in the later years, Jewish perspectives on long-term pastoral care. So without further ado, I uh, turn the floor over to our first speaker, um, Dr. Michalczyk. Thank you, Nicole. I'm very pleased to be part of this, and we are always delighted to have Council Holman here. And I'm sure both he and uh, Father Bernhard Norn know quite a bit about the University of Munich because both of them have studied there for some time. Um, my job is to give the context for this kind of resistance. So in 1933, when Hitler became chancellor, and then the following year, Fuhrer, immediately he set about trying to dismantle constitutional law. He took many steps to outlaw not only the Communist Party, but also any other political competition. Seeing that, gradually as that power grew, the generals were very much concerned about where Germany was going. So in 1938, there was a first attempt at a coup, uh, at an assassination attempt uh, of Hitler because they had seen that they were going in the wrong direction. Righteousness, lawfulness, justice were ideas that were simply going to be ignored and not tolerated, especially by the Third Reich administration. So gradually from that point on, resistance started to begin in terms of hardcore resistance, but not so much inside of Germany, although it did so, it was very, very difficult. The Gestapo uh, had its tentacles in every single organization. It had spies. So resistance was difficult. And yet those who did contribute were extremely noteworthy. And I'd like to you know, point out many of those to show you how the White Rose fits into that type of resistance. The first military uh, coup, of course, uh, was attempted in 1938 by the generals. The one that we know more about is, of course, the July 20th, uh, 1944 attempt uh, that almost succeeded. And the generals had seen already where the war was going, and especially after Stalingrad in 1943 and its defeat, the Soviet army progressing toward uh, Germany. They had attempted this coup, uh, this assassination, uh, with Klaus von Stauffenberg, and of course, if you've seen the film Valkyrie, you would understand that it was just a matter of coincidence that the assassination did not take place. Uh, with the bomb being planted by von Stauffenberg in a small chamber, the valise was moved with the bomb on the other side of the oak table, and it blew outwards instead of toward Hitler, and Hitler survived. So this kind of military resistance was uh, extremely important. Uh, the generals, including Rommel, were somehow affiliated with trying to bring down uh, 
the disastrous Third Reich. Then you had the more philosophical democratic group called the Kreisau Circle with Helmut von Molchte. And he and that circle were very much interested in seeing where Germany would be after the fall of the country, uh, <clears throat> especially in 44 and early 45. Uh, there was a concern that Germany would lose the war and a whole government, a democratic Christian government, would have to be set up. So Helmut von jo uh, Molchte, uh, Father Alfred Delp, many others uh, belonged to this clandestine group uh, in a move toward a more democratic Germany. And then you had a type of armed resistance, less so in Germany, but all over Europe. Uh, the SOE, the Special Operations Executive, coming out of London. You had the French resistance. So <clears throat> it had to be coordinated, and that was an attempt on all these fronts in order to bring about a common united front in order to uh, bring down the Third Reich. And then you had a spiritual resistance. Uh, Pastor Kai Munk in Denmark uh, preached from the pulpit very dangerously uh, during the Nazi occupation of the country. And uh, he was executed by the Gestapo and his body thrown on the, the wayside. So he was an example of a type of concern for the Jewish people, but also the totalitarian regime that had taken over his country, but other countries as well, all through Europe. The second example of a spiritual resistance is Pastor Andre Trockme. He was the pastor of a Luth uh, Huguenot church in southwestern uh, France, and at this country church in Le Chambon, the 5,000 residents of this area were able to rescue close to 5,000 Jews. It was almost a one-per-one one ratio of rescue. The Huguenots had suffered under Catholics in the 17th or 18th century, and they knew what persecution was, so they welcomed into their own, uh, their own fold the Jewish refugees. The other types of resistance would uh, include uh, more philosophical uh, discussions about what could be happening in Germany. And these were, uh, you know, more informal, but yet they were simply very important. Uh, and I think the confessing church, uh, as opposed to the national church in uh, Germany would also be very, very effective in trying to handle issues such as euthanasia uh, and concern about uh, <clears throat> where religion would take place in a Germany that was being Nazified. So that's the general context of resistance. And how do you do that with an all-powerful machine that's been operative since 1933? So in 1942, summer of 1942, <clears throat> this young group that uh, Council Hallmann had mentioned in the University of Munich gathered together in order to understand how they could better help Germany in this awful, tragic situation. Stalingrad had just fallen, was about to fall in February of 1943, and the Soviets were pushing toward Germany. So there was a sense of defeat in the air. And that promoted some of their ideas, but more importantly, they had been, some of them, like Han Scholl, uh, had been on the Eastern Front as medics. They were in pre-med, basically, and some of the others were in philosophy. And they had a common interest in seeing where Germany would be going uh, in the future, and definitely going downhill with the totalitarian regime. Secondly, they had seen the atrocities in Europe but especially on the Eastern Front. The Eisenzatz group uh, were killing Jews, these mobile killing units. They had witnessed that, and they had brought back this information to the group. So from summer of 1942 until February of 1943, they were very much engaged in leafleting, uh, graffiti on the walls, down with Hitler, and so on. 
and especially trying to communicate with others to reflect on the destiny of Germany. And this was an uphill battle because the Gestapo had spies everywhere, including at the University of Munich. There were Nazis who were part of the establishment, and it was the Professor Kurt Huber and this group that continued the leaflets. There were six that were done by them, and they were very much inspired by uh, their reading, their philosophical reading, their church readings, uh, but especially uh, Bishop von Gallen, who helped defy the Nazis on the euthanasia issue in 1939. So by 1942, they had already published six leaflets, usually about 100, 150. They had distributed them. Uh, they had mailed them. The young women in the movement would drop them off at certain circles. But then in February, uh, they were caught. They were brought before the People's Court in Berlin. And this uh, rabid judge, Roland Freisler, uh, condemned them to death. So they were condemned on one day, and the next day they were guillotined as an example. Hans Scholl, Sophie Scholl, and Christoph Probst. But at the very end, they had seen that they had planted some seeds. Uh, another two years would go by before those seeds would be affected. The British RAF distributed one of their last leaflets in flyers coming from airplanes flying over Germany. I'd like to you know, conclude with this last statement. How can we expect righteousness to prevail when there is hardly anyone willing to give himself up individually to a righteous cause. Such a fine sunny day, and I have to go, says Sophie Soul. But what does my death matter? If through us, thousands of people are awakened and stirred to action. That's their motto, action. Thank you. When I studied at the University of Munich, I used to walk every day almost through the grand staircase. It was the site where the students used to drop the leaflets. You will see a picture of the grand staircase outside in the exhibit. And when I was a student in my early 20s, I was inspired by the courage of these students. But I did not know much about the inspirations or about the background. So I took the opportunity of the invitation to come here and share with you a little bit about the White Rose to study more about the inspirations of this group and the background. Now, first of all, I realized that these students came from very different backgrounds. The Scholl, par the Scholl parents were pietistic Protestants so that Hans and Sophie, during their rebellious years as high school students, even joined the Hitler Youth and the League of German Girls. Alexander Schmorell was half Russian, half German, and culturally at home in the Russian Orthodox Church. Christoph Probst had a secular upbringing and was free thinking. Professor Huber was Catholic, but not practicing. Willy Graf was probably the most consistently Catholic. So what did they have in common? What made them work together for the resistance? I would like to mention now three important religious or cultural experiences that turned out to be decisive for them. First, the impact of youth associations. In the early 20th century, the youth associations were very important. Of course, these camps were an opportunity for getting away from home together with peers. But these associations were more. They were a space for living freedom and friendship and for developing a responsibility for the nation, but not in a nationalistic sense. Many young men and women after the First World War shared a desire for culture and values. 
They were in search for their roots, for something that was true and lasting. In this context, faith and religious life played an important role in some groups. For example, Willy Graf was a member of the Jesuit-founded Bund Neudeutschland. Hans and Sophie Scholl, after having realized the dangerous ideology of the Hitler Youth, became members of another independent group. I say independent group, but because for Hitler, he tried to um, force everybody into the Hitler Youth, because he saw the popularity of this youth movement. And although it was forbidden, Willy Graf and the Scholls decided to be part of other associations. And especially exactly this was the time and this was the moment when they became more radical in their opposition against the regime. Now they discovered more and more the value of belonging to the church, to a church that provided a perspective beyond the National Socialist ideology. Now, as a second point, I would like to mention the impact of Catholic intellectuals. In line with these values I just mentioned, many later members of the White Rose decided to study at the medical school in Munich because they thought that this discipline would be not too ideological. They also thought that they were able to do their military service during the summer breaks as combat medics behind the front lines. But apart from their studies, their quest for freedom and for roots continued. Soon they got in contact with a circle of seasoned Catholic intellectuals around Karl Muth and Theodor Hecker. These inter intellectuals belonged to the Catholic cultural journal Hochland, which is maybe comparable to America magazine. In 1941, the Nazis suppressed the journal for its opposition to the regime, but the editors and authors continued to meet and they continued to discuss the signs of the times from philosophical, theological and literary point of, views, of view. It is important to see that these intellectuals in the Hochland circle were not active in the resistance. But for our students, they provided an environment for debating political ideas, the Christian vocation, and the role of the personal conscience in that situation. They discussed, for example, John Henry Newman, they read Augustine, Pascal, Kierkegaard, and the authors of the French Catholic Renewal. It's very interesting also in the secluded library of a Benedictine monastery in Munich, they studied Thomas Aquinas on the legitimacy of killing a tyrant. <laughs> With all the war around, they immersed themselves into an alternative world of literature and philosophy. They developed an existential Christian faith and they were stunned by the horizons that faith opened for them. Then a third point, already Prof Professor Michalczyk mentioned it uh, briefly, the impact of the war experiences. Now you might think that these young students were trying to escape from the realities of war when we see that they were engaged in these youth movements and then later on in this intellectual circle. But the opposite was the case. Hans Scholl, Alexander Schmorell and Willy Graf had to serve as medics at the Russian front in summer 1942. On their journey through Poland, they learned about the extermination of the Jews, they witnessed Jews being mistreated in the Warsaw Ghetto, and in Russia they saw the atrocities of the German army carried out. It was a confrontation with the reality of war that many Germans at home did not see or did not want to realize. And this was for them the call to action. The cultural and religious sensitivity helped the students to identify more clearly the evil that was happening. And most important, the Christian faith provided motivation, strength and hope. Now, when you read the letters from prison, you will discover highly religious texts. In the leaflets, however, 
religious topics are not prominent. And I also would not consider the White Rose a primarily religious group, definitely not in an institutional sense. Apart from these few mentioned individual Catholic mentors, the churches did not support their activities. The official position of the Protestants and of the Catholic Church towards the Nazi regime was mutual non-interference. The churches wanted to continue serving the faithful, and as long as this was assured, most church authorities did not speak up against the regime. Catholics, for example, were neither allowed nor encouraged to politically resist. After the war, then, the Catholic Church celebrated her martyrs and enjoyed the praise for not having given in to the totalitarian system. And it's interesting, only the Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia declared Alexander Shmorel a saint. That was in 2012. Maybe we can ask for a conclusion where these students may be too unruly, not only in a political, but also in a religious sense. In prison, just before being led to execution, the Friends of the White Rose told the prison chaplain that they desired to receive communion together. You remember, they were coming from very different uh, religious backgrounds. So Sophie Scholl said, for us, the denominational differences don't matter anymore. But the chaplain refused to do so. So a Catholic, a Protestant, and an Orthodox priest had to be called. The guards, however, allowed them to share one last cigarette, which turned out to be almost a sacrament of communion for all of them. Pope Francis has repeatedly spoken of the ecumenism of the martyrs. Also in this regard, the students of the White Rose are a great example for me. Thank you. Before I start, does anyone want to sit down who's currently standing? Because feel free to take a seat. So I am probably one of the few rabbis you will encounter who had one of her recommendations to rabbinical school written by a Lutheran minister in Berlin. Um, <laughs> I um, was born into a family with a Jewish mother from New York, where my great-grandfather was ordained at the Jewish Theological Seminary, and a father with this, um, with this very um, mixed up or, or multi-faceted, multiple antecedent German history. And um, I'll, so Franz von Hammerstein, who wrote that letter, um, did his PhD in Buber. He did this after being released from um, Dachau, where he had been held as a family member of his brothers who had been involved in the July 20th plot. Um, so I'm going to do a quick Buber teaching in his honor as part of what we do here, because I think it speaks to our theme today. Um, in the later masters, he, he writes about how we understand this phrase that is thrown around so much, and I say that with love, um, <laughs> to love your neighbor as yourself, um, so often quoted as a core religious teaching. And Buber teaches that this is not about um, that what one needs to understand in understanding these words is that just as you have particular needs, the goal is to understand what those particular needs of the other are in serving them. And if you look at the, the Hebrew of this phrase, the kamocha, the word like yourself, can either, in Buber's understanding, is being used to modify the verb to love. Um, you can also take it to modify the word um, your neighbor is like you versus love in a way that is loved um, in a similar manner. So that second part can teach us of the incredible importance of seeing in the other that core finding in the other something that can elicit true empathy. 
Um, so I, I bring that in, in my great uncle's memory and want to speak just about um, this, this group um, because I did not know the descendants of the um, the shoals or the, or I did not know the people who died in the White Rose resistance, but when I went to Berlin as a 21 year old, um, the first people I was introduced to were the grandchildren of those who had been in Dachau with my great aunts and uncles. And so the Bonhoeffer <laughs> grandchild was immediately, you know, brought to my table. And it was just sort of this realization that still in Germany in the 19, this was the late 1980s, there was a sense of who who had stood up um, and how those families were, were still part of an inner circle. Um, and stories of what had been shared in, in Dachau among those who had been there. Um, so what I learned is really what I want to... Um, say a few words about and then come back to, to this exhibit. Um, and to, to use that knowledge to think about our 21st century spiritual identities, um, so much of which are formed in a culture now that has become unchurched, has become about spirituality versus religion. And, and to think about these movements, um, the, the youth movements that you spoke to so um, powerfully that brought out freedom versus the, were in complete opposition to the authoritarianism of National Socialism. And my grandmother was part of that. I, I mentioned my two great uncles. My grandmother left Berlin already in 1935 when she was being threatened by the Gestapo. Her father, who had stepped, had been um, removed from his position, um, as a leader of the German army um, in 1934, after he had repeatedly um, been warning the, the president about the dangers of Hitler as a chancellor, and after he had um, done various already clear acts of resistance, was removed from that position, he still had access to a fair amount of information. So he would pass information to my grandmother about um, Jews and communists in Berlin who were threatened, and she would quietly go on her motorbike and, um, and warn them, and at times in the sidecar take people over the border into Czechoslovakia to get them out before they would be, before they would be um, apprehended. Um, she would not talk about this herself. She wrote a little bit, but it was still, she would not talk about it. Um, she and my grandfather, who was of German descent, of Jewish descent, his family had converted out, left already in 1935, and so were um, not there to witness and to be um, imprisoned, but, but had their whole own narrative as they got stuck in Japan for 12 years, uh, 14 years. 35 to 49. Um, something, though, that was so clear about my grandmother and her siblings is they were famous um, among the extended family as having been wild children. There were seven children, and they were known for just being the worst teenagers any of you would want to have to deal with. Um, and, and there was just this incredible understanding of breaking with what we know, I think, today has been characterized as this very rigid form of raising children that was um, part of German culture. And these kids went wild. Um, they had one Catholic parent and one Protestant parent. They were un... Um, they, they moved between church communities and they um, roamed free. And that was, they and thus were able to find these, um, the freer parts of Berlin culture at that time and were very much intermixed with um, a, a very um, strong Jewish culture there. And so, I bring that to you because when you read the writings of the people who you will see featured in this exhibit, um, some of it speaks so much to that same spirit. Um, in the, Sophie Scholl writes in 1942, I have learned that a tough spirit without a de gentle heart is just as infertile as a gent gentle heart without a tough spirit. 
I think it was a Maritain who said, il faut avoir un esprit de et le corps tendre. A word not experienced by the soul is a dead word, and an emotion not giving birth to a thought is futile. What you see in that is just a liveliness of spirit and of exploration and of, of combining thought with feeling with action. And, and that's what I saw in this generation, this group of people who, um, after the war, they did survive. My two great uncles went into hiding. They only knew, they only found one of their, they got confused, the Nazis, after the, the plot was discovered and thought there was only one von Hammerstein involved. And so one was in hiding in, in Berlin and one disappeared with another identity in south, southern Germany. Both of them, for the decades after the war, were involved first in hunting down those who were guilty and in being witnesses to that, and then in, in the history of Germany and trying to write a truthful history. Their other brother um, went on to be one of the founders of Action Reconciliation Service for peace. They, they never stopped being who they were, and there was a truth in their spirit that carried on. Um, and yet, the other piece I'll say is just they were incredibly normal people, <laughs> and who, who listened, who were brought up in a way that they were taught to listen to, um, to the possibility of what was deeply right, and, and not to conform. So I'll conclude there. So I'll very, very briefly summarize and then add a couple thoughts of my own. Um, we see in Professor Michalczyk's talk how resistance could be found in many reform, uh, many forms, and how resistance can come in each case, whether it be military or spiritual or intellectual. Uh, in all of these cases, whenever there was an alternative moral framework to be accessed, and so I think that that um, the idea of finding an underlying ideology and underlying uh, underlying truth is. Um, is key here to all of these kinds of resistance, no matter how they were framed. Uh, in uh, Dr. Knorn's talk, we see that despite um, disparate religious and cultural backgrounds, that the uh, common shared experience, both through uh, formative experiences and youth groups, we might call it student formation here on Boston College's campus, um, how the role of community uh, becomes important in this formation uh, toward resistance and how uh, even having the access to an, um, to an individual al alternative framework uh, means very little unless there is a community of support to go along with it. Uh, and we see how the impact of the Catholic intellectual tradition and very much so the experience of the war, which is something that I uh, read and research about and write about, um, at how the experience of the war does um, change from the intellectual problem to the actual lived experience of individual suffering and dying and making those kinds of choices. And something I'll raise here in a moment is that for every um, Hans Scholl uh, or Christoph Probst, there were hundreds of thousands of soldiers, of medics who continued to fight, who went home on leave and came back. Um, and we have the memoirs um, and diaries in those cases of those who didn't survive, of people who felt both ways. Um, and uh, finally, with uh, Rabbi Pasha Orlov's, uh, uh, Orlov's talk, sorry, I can't not say that V, I'm sorry, talk, um, I think the mo most beautiful words of Martin Buber, um, this reflection on the, the idea of loving your neighbor as yourself, but more so to see in the other, finding in the other, that which can elicit true empathy. Um, that's something that um, dovetails with the thoughts that I had um, thinking about the White Rose Movement, thinking about uh, resistance is that uh, one of the biggest questions I have is how we define our community and how we draw the borders between us and others. And we celebrate the White Rose Movement in part because its participants were martyrs for a noble cause, uh, or because, um, very much so, because we have the material traces. We have these leaflets. We have this fetish of, of seeing the words and seeing the texts. Um, and how these, once the Royal Air Force was able to obtain one copy, could duplicate them and broadcast them, broadcast the truth all over Germany. 
Um, yet, even though we celebrate this transmission of this noble resistance, as we know, the reception was limited. Uh, very few people, upon hearing the truth, very few people resisted. Uh, very few people read the words and therefore could then see and take action. Uh, and we know also um, that the other major act of resistance that happened afterwards, the July 1944 coup attempt, uh, was carried out by people who were in the upper echelons of the regime, who had participated, um, no matter how uh, enthusiastically or begrudgingly, had, uh, had participated and only took part in this coup when it seemed that Hitler was an unfitting commander leading the country to destruction. So my first question to the panel, um, and I'll keep uh, making a few comments after, is do you think that there is a danger when focusing on the heroism of an individual resistance movement um, in obscuring the fact that the exception proves the rule? Or is there something very powerful to be learned when it is even more rare? Um, and so what I mean by this is um, why do so people, so if we see people engaged in spiritual life and intellectual life, why do so few of them uh, act similarly? And I'm not just talking about 1939 to 45. Uh, why do so few turn thoughts and feelings into actions, in the word of, words of Rabbi Pasha Orla? We see um, Bishop Galen's protest of euthanasia in 1941, uh, and to a partial extent, although um, uh, limited, the White Rose Movement finally, uh, primarily being concerned with the ethical foundations of a German nation. Uh, this is not fit for Germany. Uh, we, as Germans, need our spiritual rebirth. It, it will be democratic, it will be Christian, it will be all kinds of different things depending on the audience. Um, the White Rose Movement did indeed in their leaflets uh, decry the murder of, at that point, hundreds of thousands of Jews. Um, but they remain motivated very much by the zeitgeist, and I use that in the American sense, um, of a sense of German nationalism, of being students of philosophy and motivated by these dreams of an invigorated Germany. And so we're all rightly familiar with uh, the Lutheran pastor Martin Niemöller's uh, poignant poem about resistance, which I'll only read the first line of. First they came for the socialists or the communists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. So Niemöller himself, you know where this poem goes, had supported Hitler's rise to power, had supported the movement until Hitler insisted on the supremacy of state over religion. And it was only then that he opposed and was sent in 1937 to Dachau. So using this formulation of Niemöller, using Niemöller's own life case, I wanna ask another question. And this is in the words of the historian David Hollinger who studies um, American intellectual history and the problems of race and ethnicity in the 20th century here in the US. And a phrase he uses is, how wide the circle of we? And so who is the us? If the, the question was about the rebirth of the spiritual German nation, or was this about humanity, do we have an ever permanent danger in nationalism, even if we try to fill its content with something else? And so my final um, rhetorical question, perhaps, <laughs> is what is the power of a leaflet? What is the power of truth if no one listens? And I think this question is particularly relevant today when censorship is less the question about whether or not you can get the word out, uh, rather than the challenge, as it was also from 1933 to 1945, of an overabundance of counter perspective. So I will sit here. So maybe I could start with this, the first question in terms of, you know, the impact that they had made and, you know, what this meant for Germany and also maybe the mythologizing and almost canonizing, as we had talked about, of these individuals. They were doing something illegal. So, and they were not considered patriots. And yet, that legacy that's restored shows that they were the honest patriots who had really fulfilled a mission of trying to restore Germany to a sense of righteousness. So I think that theirs is a complicated case because on one hand they'd be considered traitors and that's how the People's Court on the Freisler looked at them. Uh, and at the same time, they're looked at as heroes today, 
the martyrs that we talk about. And the idea of martyrdom is being a witness to something. And what they had witnessed personally, collectively, was an abuse of the human being, whether it was the Jews that were slaughtered in Russia or uh, the fact that you know individuals in Germany had lost all their freedoms. So they would be considered today as the honest patriots, but at that time, the traitors. So I think that legacy is complicated, but today I think we, we see that with a, a long range view, especially after this research that we've done on uh, the movement, that they indeed did stand up for justice when very few others did. Just to respond to your question about um, this, how big is the circle of we and what's the permanent danger in nationalism, um, something that I think was in terms of values that were handed down to me from some of these people. One very clear one was always have your foot in the door. And, and that sort of expression meaning, God forbid you be in a situation where you not be able to look in from the outside on what is happening inside. And, and so that's the limit to nationalism, right? I mean, that's the limit to being a, we, at, at the point when you are only inside one narrative, something's wrong. And, and our moral capacity has to be to hold multiple narratives. And at the point when we can't do that, something is desperately wrong. Let me just follow up uh, on uh, both of these points a little bit. Um, for me, the focus is where there are only so few who took action. Now we um, highlighted mostly these maybe five, six, seven uh, students with uh, the professor who drafted the leaflets and who distributed the leaflets and then who were executed. But when you go through the exhibit, you will see that there were many more people involved. Some, of course, also got um, sentences and needed to serve in prison, but others were not caught at all. They were not found. And I don't know exactly, maybe uh, you know a little bit more uh, how many were involved in the White Rose, but I think uh, there were at least, uh, let's say, 50 or, um, or even more people who helped, for example, distributing the leaflets, who um, gave money for their actions, who helped people to stay overnight somewhere. And um, maybe if we widen the circle, then we will see that... Sorry, I'll turn that off. Yeah. <laughs> that um, it was not only these few heroes that we celebrate today, but um, there were many more with whom maybe we could also identify. And um, this could be also something for us to see um, how we today could contribute in some way um, if we are not um, called to be these uh, very few heroes. Maybe commenting on why there were so few. I think it was most difficult in Germany. The fear factor is huge. Mm -hmm. And especially if someone was caught, they would, they would also have to, I think I'm speaking to the antenna. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but uh, I believe that, you know, with the, is it called the Schippenhaft? where the family would also be uh, threatened and jailed or sent to a concentration camp. So in many cases, uh, individuals were afraid to act. So that, that fear factor prevented many from doing that. But I think also those uh, individuals who had the courage had this kind of background. Why would you do it? And then I always ask, what's the turning point from non-action to action? And I think we considered it in some ways, you know, their personal experiences, their upbringing, their youth groups, uh, but also something inside of them that indicated that they were risk takers. And a risk taker would really be facing a kind of 
uh, future that was destined to end in jail or extermination. So the Shoals faced that, and the three of them, to serve as an example of treason, were guillotined the next day or within several hours of that decision by the People's Court because they were a threat. If that kind of idea of a martyr would be sent out amongst you know, the, the rest, there were about 50 to 60, according to Jorgen Wittgenstein, who were actively involved. And if that message went out, that would serve as an example for them of what could happen to you if you did the same thing. So I think, you know, in terms of why there were so few, especially in Germany, that would explain some of it. And so it's more remarkable to see the courage part of it that we're expressing today with the exhibit and with our presentation. Yeah, I was wondering what, um, after those, uh, those uh, young people were exterminated or uh, executed. What happened to their families? What were the repercussions? Um, several of them uh, were threatened, but they were some of them, like Jorgen Wittgenstein, who came to the United States. Uh, he said he and his family were threatened, mm -hmm. but he was able to uh, somehow elude the Gestapo when they uh, threatened him. Uh, the family of the Scholes actually came to visit them as a last act. I think uh, Wittgenstein helped set it up so that they could see them just moments before they were guillotined. Um, I don't know about the rest of the family. Maybe you know. Yeah. Um, it is important to see what um, John already mentioned, that there was this Sippenhaft. Sippenhaft means that um, when one member of a family commits um, a crime, in the Nazi time, then the other um, family members will be uh, held responsible for it, and then th they will also be imprisoned and so on. So this happened, for example, to the Scholl family. Um, I don't know how long, but at least for some weeks or some or some months, they were imprisoned uh, just because they were members of the very family, and um, others were able to es escape. Others were able to hide. Um, but uh, this was also always a threat, and that's also why so few uh, took the risk. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, please. Uh, George Fry, I'm from a community group of Jewish fascism in terms of today, but the question I wanted to pose is, didn't they wait too long, as heroic as they were, if they had done what they'd done in 1933, when there was actually street fighting going on between Nazis and mm -hmm. communists and others? I believe Hans Nemo actually said if we had acted decisively early on, maybe they would have killed 30,000 of us, but we would have stopped Hitler early on. So this question of people underestimating what Hitler represented, even I believe some people said, well, he'll get exposed and then we'll elect somebody else because people will get sick of him. And they greatly underestimated what he was going to do with the help of a section of people in the ruling circle. Don't you think this was a, one of the, the premier lessons of all this? It's heroic as they were, they were just 10 years too late. Yeah, well, as you can see, look at the pattern of what was happening all over Germany. Hitler, those first five, six years, seemed to be doing great. You know, they're building up uh, an economy, Autobahn. the army, they, even though they violated the Treaty of Versailles, they were still on the move and new roads were being built. So it looked like a very opportunistic time to say, I guess he's doing okay. But I think the turning point was 37, 38, when people began to see, for example, the, the plight of the Jews. After the 36 Olympics, things went back. The anti-Semitism was rampant. So I think a lot of people were concerned. Those who could fled. But others, you know, had that fear factor too, as it became much more difficulty with the development of the SS and then with 1939, with the entrance into the war, any act like that would be considered treason and immediate death. So people wouldn't want to take those chances, I think. So I, I still look at 1942 as, you know, early enough, and even the, uh, the various attempts on Hitler's life, maybe about 10, 15, 20, maybe more uh, different points. But it was very difficult, so I think you know, putting ourselves in that situation. Who would want to take that risk? 
Well, just one example. What year was it when they took all the Jewish professors out of the universities? That was early on, wasn't it? 34, 35, the Civil Servant Act removed a lot of the teachers, lawyers, doctors from the professions. It was a civil profession act that just eliminated them completely. So, right, people should have you know, stood up then. But again, when you're threatened, you worry about your family. If I can add in um, very briefly, uh, I think the context of 1933, uh, sort of a micro history of that very short period of time is really uh, relevant in this case. As you mentioned, there's street fighting. It's the power hasn't been consolidated yet. But at the same time, if you take into <clears throat> to account the context of uh, the massive inflation and the collapse of the economy, the mostly uh, unified opposition to Versailles, uh, the Versailles Treaty and its terms by everyone except the communists, uh, and yet the communists increasing violence and increasing allegiance uh, with the Comintern and with uh, Moscow and with Stalin. Uh, that it, you see as it's happening throughout Europe, but also in particular in Germany, um, um, sort of a collapse of any real liberal democratic alternative. Uh, uh, German politics has, the sort of middle has fallen out and it's, it's a sort of uh, a, a violent left or a violent right. And so it's quite easy um, in retrospect for Hitler to manufacture crises, a Reichstag fire, uh, similar street battles uh, in order to present the communists as the greater threat at the time and in order to create a series of emergencies that makes people who might otherwise oppose or otherwise be doubtful um, fall into line because the other side might be worse. Well, and and, as an example of that, um, two of my great aunts already in the late 1920s were part of the Communist Party in Berlin already informing the Soviet Union about what was going on with the, with the National Socialists. And so there were people trying, I mean, there was a whole um, leftist 20, you know, 19, 20 year olds involved in Trump, but they didn't have anything internal. They were already spies basically for the, for the Soviet Union because there was no left in that way to organize with inside. And, and the grand irony of that, to link it to today, is that when my grandparents got to this country, they were unemployable because of the tie to the Communist Party in the McCarthy era. So it was one, you know, the irony of, of just what it means to stand on the left through the history, through the course of time. You know, and also in terms of the Russian, the communist kind of thing that you're mentioning, the Red Orchestra was uh, very efficient in distributing information from Germany to Moscow. And someone who was very parallel to Sophie Scholl would be Cato von Bunches from the Netherlands. And she was looked at as a martyr as well because uh, she was picked up by the Gestapo and executed called, you know, for treason because she was affiliated with the Red Orchestra as Mildred Harnack and others. Another question? I'll ask a final question, if there are no others, I'll ask a final question for our, our group, which is a general open question I think we've all been interested to touch on it, is um, what relevance does this movement have to current national and world affairs, and I mean that generally speaking, sort of in the 21st century? Um, does, it, does the White Rose movement in particular have um, a resonance, or is it mostly interesting to us as an historical phenomenon embedded within Nazism? And so we've talked about the Catholic intellectual tradition, the general intellectual and spiritual tradition. Um, what lessons uh, can we take from it, or, or should we be looking elsewhere for those lessons? <laughs> In 144 they, characters or less. There's a, very, there's a very clear quote that you'll see in the exhibit, or I read in some of the material about the exhibit, of, of the point at which educating ourselves has to turn to action. When, and it, it occurred when they had gone to the front and seen um, the violence that was being inflicted upon a part of, of the, of, upon Jews and upon um, communists and so on. So, I think that moment of learning from them the point at which we have to go from reading and educating ourselves and, and when, when, when does it then, when do you take the step to action, I think is an important piece to learn from their story. I think in terms of, go ahead. I just want to, <laughs> to strengthen yeah, uh, the thing before, before action. Um, 
for me, it is uh, striking uh, with these uh, students that they were so open for uh, new inspirations. They were not just um, ex experts in their own field. They didn't study only philosophy or only medicine, but uh, they were open to literature, to philosophy, um, to religion, and especially this looking beyond your own horizon that made it possible to uh, realize what's going on and to interpret it more clearly and to see that we cannot go on just uh, let the politics do, uh, politicians do what they are doing and so on. They are the experts. Everything is too complicated. No, we know exactly that um, when, when we uh, study um, our world in a wide range with a wide horizon, then we can also ourselves be creative and uh, be sensitive for what is going on. You know, when I see how they act, it, I try to reflect on what is the turning point and what has to take place beforehand before you make a decision. How many rights will be taken away from you? And secondly, if you have empathy for someone else and their rights are taken care of, do you have that guts, chutzpah, to take that step and act on their behalf, as they were doing. They were all non-Jewish, as you saw, but yet they were very much concerned about the extermination of Jews in Russia. So I think that sense of empathy uh, is a turning point for them too, that they could put themselves in someone else's shoes and say, look, they're being persecuted. We have to stand up. And I think that seemed to me part of the turning point uh, besides the general uh, situation in Germany with the regime. Great. I'd like to thank our panelists and thank the organizers and uh, enjoy the exhibition. Thanks for coming today. <laughs>